Welcome to our talk tonight. I am Bonnie Lane Malcolmson, the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Northwest Art here at the Portland Art Museum. And it is my great pleasure tonight to do some introductions and um, of um, Dr. Drucker and Jim Riswald and to talk to you um, a bit of, about how our evening is going to work and also invite you um, after our discussion tonight and um, following questions because um, uh, Jim and Dr. Drucker are going to um, talk about Jim's work and oncology in general and art and cancer and how things can work together and, and um, uh, help to educate the world. And uh, then you'll have the opportunity, because the galleries will be open till 8 o'clock, to go up in the Hoffman wing of the museum, which is the wing above our gift shop. So it's out this building, across the little courtyard, up the few stairs. And then if you take the elevator right past the gift shop up to the fourth floor, you'll see um, Jim's piece, the uh, a big bowl of chemotherapies and one Zofran, which is kind of the reason why this talk started. Um, I had the pleasure of um, seeing Jim's work for probably the third or fourth time at the um, Augen Gallery last year when he had his exhibit, Art for Oncologists, and the exhibit Re it was really powerful for me. I thought it was just a brilliant exhibit. And uh, the combination of sculpture and photographs and um, informational panels and the, the whole show I thought was just really great. And thank you, tough buddy. and strong and smart. I love well, it, thank you know. You. Hey, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you get a critical review. And you know, criticism can be nice. Um, I've heard that and I'm not always nice, but Really? I, yeah, well, you're lucky. Um, I had a really strong reaction to that show and just thought that it was brilliant. And so I asked um, Jim in the Augen Gallery if we could borrow the big bowl of chemotherapies for the museum for a year. Sometimes when I can't quite afford to buy something, I um, beg it. And then I hope later that I can talk other people into helping me buy it for posterity. And this isn't a pitch exactly, but kind of. And um, so I really wanted to bring it into the museum because we do have thousands of people that come through in a year and have the opportunity to see it. It. And so I wanted that to happen, and I, and I've just, it's been delightful to have it here, and tough, and interesting, and I see people always looking at it and studying it, and spending time reading the wall, which I really like. But now I'm going to introduce um, each of them, and then they're just going to talk to you for a bit, and after they're done. Um, Feel free to ask some questions, and then any of you that like will go up to the galleries, and I think Jim's going to come up, and I'm going to come up, and you're welcome to come up if you like as well. So um, Jim Riswold received his Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy, history, and communications at the University of Washington in Seattle in 1983. He's had over 15 solo exhibitions, including the exhibition that prompted this talk, the one I mentioned, Art for Oncologists, um, last year at the Augen Gallery. And uh, among his other solo exhibitions were Philosophy is Not Funny at the Wyden and Kennedy Gallery in Portland in 2012, The War to End All Wars That Didn't End All Wars, that was at Augen Gallery, um, Han, Ham Sandwiches and Mayo, spelled Mao. M, Mao, I should say that, <laughs> Mao, is that better? Ham Sandwiches Slight and difference. Mao, <laughs> I've always called him, called him Mayo to Sung, but then, you know, I, it's just terrible. I'm bad at pronouncing things, but there you go, Mao. <laughs> Ham sandwiches and Mao and other items at the gallery at 72nd and Sunny, Los Angeles in 2010, and the Marie Antoinette's Head and Others at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art in Eugene. He's been included in numerous group exhibitions in the Northwest and is represented in public and private collections, including the Allen Memorial Art Museum at Oberlin College in Ohio, the Halley Ford Museum at Willamette University in Salem, the Henry Art Gallery at the University of Washington in Seattle, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Washington, or University of, sorry, of Oregon in Eugene. You didn't hear that. <laughs> Museum of Art at Washington State University in Pullman, and of course the Portland Art Museum here, and the Tacoma Art Museum, and the Jordan Schnitzer Collection. Oh, and he's represented in the Jordan Schnitzer Collection and the Gordon Sunderland Collection as well. Um, 
uh, Jim Riswold's a 2013 inductee of One Club Creative Hall of Fame in New York and received the 2012 Timeless Award from the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. And now... And I got a medal for it. Did you get a medal? <laughs> oh my goodness. That's amazing. That's great. I've never gotten a medal. I like medals. Um, and then... <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to have a medal at some point. <laughs> I've got a building. Um, Dr. Brian Drucker is director of OHSU's Knight Cancer Institute, associate dean for oncology of the OHSU School of Medicine, Gerald Wen chair of leukemia research at Oregon Health Sciences University, and investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Upon graduating from the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine in 1981, Dr. Drucker completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at Barnes Hospital, Washington School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. He trained in oncology at Harvard's Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and then returned to the lab to begin his research career studying the regulation of growth of cancer cells and practical application to cancer therapies. Dr. Drucker's work in the lab, which he continued after joining OHSU in 1993, helped pioneer the practice of precision or personalized cancer medicine, which targets the molecular underpinnings of an individual's cancer while leaving healthy cells unharmed. In collaboration with Novartis, his laboratory performed preclinical studies that were instrumental to the development of Gleevec, a drug that targets the molecular defect in chronic myeloid leukemia, or CML. After completing a series of preclinical studies, Dr. Drucker spearheaded the highly successful clinical trials of Gleevec for CML, which um, led to FDA approval of the drug in record time. Dr. Drucker's role in the development of Gleevec and its application in the clinic has resulted in numerous awards for Dr. Drucker, including the Warren Albert Prize from Harvard Medical School, the American Cancer Society's Medal of Honor, and the 2009 Laser DeBakey Award for Clinical um, Medical Research. He was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies in 2003, the American Association of Physicians in 2006, the National Academy of Sciences in 2007, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2012. Please welcome both Jim Roswald and Dr. Drucker tonight. We're so glad to have them. Well, he also saved my life, <laughs> um, which my ego goes to tell me that if you save my life, you'll get a lot of awards, and Phil Knight will try to give you a shit ton of money. <laughs> so keep it up. Um, I, uh, I actually kind of used to work for Phil Knight. I worked at White and Kennedy for a number of years, until another oncologist told me something, and I didn't really understand what it meant. He told me that I had CML, and at the time, <clears throat> Um, I had two to four years to live, unless I could survive a bone marrow transplant, which I had 32% chance of surviving. Not very good odds. Um, then I met this man, and odds obviously improved. For better or worse, you'll, after tonight, you can, <laughs> you can judge. <laughs> um, uh, but, so I left Wyden, um, to jump into the world of art. Um, or as I like to say, I went from a career of selling things to people that they didn't need to making things that they didn't want. <laughs> um, and I like to call my work um, absurd realism. Others call it perverse whimsy. Still others call it a black hole sucking the life out of everything. <laughs> um, but there is a method to the madness, I think. Um, and it comes from a quote from one of my favorite human beings ever, Voltaire. He said once, I have made what but one prayer to God, a short one. O oh Lord, make my enemies ridiculous. <laughs> so I, that's a pretty good thing, I thought. Um, because laughter is the best medicine. 
Unless you have CML, then Gleevec is the best <laughs> medicine. Um, because I think humor allows us to diffuse our fears. And um, I also think that particular subject matter, such as that ungentleman on the screen there, um, might, don't mind being called monsters or evil or the worst person ever, but they don't like to be mocked. They don't like to be laughed at. And we tell ourselves these type of people or certain diseases um, should only be talked about very quietly. Hush tones. Why? You're paying reverence to the fool that craves attention. So that kind of, and I'm a philosophy major, the logic there may not be quite <clears throat> on a straight line, but that thinking um, led to my first show in 2005, um, Goring's Lunch, which included such pieces as the Hitler mobile, because any dictator worth his salt has a sweet ride. And this piece actually made it into the Northwest Biennial in Tacoma, but they had, to put a, they had to give employees talking points about how to talk about the art because it received so many complaints. Um, I myself offered to come up with pieces quite large and cover up the offending faces and symbols with Hello Kitty stickers. Also included Mussolini's tricycle. You know, he wasn't quite Hitler, so he didn't have quite the sweet ride. Hitler's car actually sold at auction a few years ago to a Russian gazillionaire for almost $10 million. Mussolini's has sold for a million. Poor guy. And here was a man that, I kid you not, wanted his tombstone to read, here lies one of the most intelligent humans ever to grace the earth. He didn't get his wish. <laughs> Ernst Röhm, um, he was a gay Nazi. Hitler had him killed. Um, just complete ridiculousness, three Nazis in a tub. You know, how does the limerick go? Rub-a-dub-dub, three fools in a tub, and who do you think they'd be? Goring, Hitler, Himmler, turn them out, knaves, all three. Three other Nazis in a tub. <laughs> Hess, Goebbels, Heydrich. And speaking of advertising, Goebbels, the minister of propaganda, learned everything he knew about propaganda from Madison Avenue and said, the most brilliant propagandist will yield, with, will yield no success unless one fundamental principle is born in mind constantly. It must confine itself to a few points and repeat them over and over and over. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. <laughs> yeah. Three lesser known Nazis in a tub. You don't even know, you need to care who they are. And Hitler's for front porch, 1945. Um, Pinochet, another dictator, and a bad person as well. His last words were, history tells us that dictators' lives don't end well. <laughs> Deservedly so. So anyway, that was my first show. At the show, one of my best friends said he was gonna, there was about 30 pieces in the show. One of my best friends said that he was gonna buy the whole show, he's extremely wealthy, so he could burn it. <laughs> Somebody actually came up to my daughter, who was probably 12 at the time, and said, Hallie, your father has some serious issues. <laughs> Which transitioned to my next work. My daughter and son went to the French American School. And after the show, they approached me and said, and asked, can you do something like your Hitler art, but without Hitler, to raise money for the school? So I did a little show, these are a couple pieces about Napoleon. That's his hat. He paid 60, 60 uh, francs for each of his hat. He always tried to talk the hat maker down and failed every time, like he would do on the battlefield many times. 
this is him going to heaven. The French actually thought he went to heaven, never mind that because of him a million Frenchmen died and the country was in complete bankruptcy after he was exiled the second time to some crummy rock in the middle of the Atlantic. And that show was in 2005, so this is Napoleon today still. <laughs> when, on October 16, 1799, Napoleon left his army to die in Egypt to return to Paris and proclaim to France, follow me, I am the god of the day. Well, today, he now lords over an empire of fine food products, olive oils, anchovies, and smoked baby clams, and whatnot. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Somewhat uh, before him was a woman named Marie Antoinette. Coupacy means cut here in France. This is Marie Antoinette after. <laughs> and that's her head. Does anybody know her final words? Pardon me, Monsieur. She stepped on the foot of her executioner. She never said, let them eat cake. But she did eat cake for breakfast every morning. And one and you would wonder if she would say, how will, I be able, how will I be able to eat my cake if my hands are over here and my head's over here? <laughs> we will never know. This guy. Uh, this was part of a, a number of shows. This first show was Mao Home and Garden. Hart Cohn Chairman Mao, get it? <laughs> Lachey's Chairman Mao. <laughs> I actually made 56 different chairs. Will you be my Valentine chairman now? <laughs> Bacon and eggs and Mao. Chicken and corn on the cob and Mao. What is fascinating to me about this subject is Mao is kitsch now. You, you can go into stores and buy recreations of stuff from the Cultural Revolution and put them in your house and have Mao posters. The man is the greatest mass murderer of all time. 70 million people perished under him, of his own people, during peacetime. And now he's kitsch. I do not understand it. The next thing I think we'll see Martha Stewart doing an episode about how to decorate your house in Mao memorabilia. <laughs> anyway, had a little fun with Caesar too. Small Caesar salad. You want, to hear, you want to hear a really lousy Caesar joke? Well, the man, the man had a month named after him, coins minted in his, offer, in his honor, uh, everybody in Rome running, and their mother running around going, Hail Caesar, and a birthing uh, procedure named after him. However, the Caesar salad is not named after Caesar. It's named after Palm Springs Cesar Kadari. And there is a really bad joke that goes with it, but I'm gonna, so I'm gonna tell it. <laughs> so it's slightly before March of 44 BC, and that's when Caesar meets his demise. And his chef comes up to him with a new creation, and it's romaine lettuce coddled eggs, Worcestershire, um, anchovies, lemon, croutons, cracked paper, cra cracked pepper, the modern ingredients, uh, the ingredients of the modern day Caesar salad. And he kneels before Caesar and goes, you shall name this salad Caesar. Caesar looks at it and goes, I name it coleslaw. <laughs> Bonnie said I did a show about World War I last year, uh, uh, two years ago, two, three years ago. She didn't give the correct title because she doesn't like to swear. The correct title of the show was The War to End All Wars That Fucked Up and Didn't End All Wars. And, and it is the centennial of, of the war this year. Um, 
my grandfather fought in the war. I'm lucky to be alive. Some of these stories that I'll tell you about. This, this show came to me while I was recovering from my second cancer. I was in the ICU for a few days and in the hospital for a few days. After that, and I cheered myself up by reading about the First World War, <laughs> such as the Kindermorn, which was an army made out of students, volunteers, and 35,000 students signed up for this army. Now, rather than dividing them between other German armies, they used them to replace completely the decimated German Fourth Army. And the Kindermorn was, these, they were like anywhere from 16 to 18 years old. Um, this, the hero or the anti-hero in war, uh, I mean, all quiet on the Western Front, is from the Kindermorn. All these kids all hopped up on nationalism, are trained by retired generals who fought in the Franco-Prussian War, old techniques against modern weapons. They see their first action in the Battle of uh, Ypres. 35,000 of these, men, these boys go into battle. 25,000 die. Um, and it is known in German history as the slaughter of the innocents. And one surviving older soldier said, the, so the generals were too old and the boys were too young. This is French pastry Joffrey. Uh, he was head of the um, French army at the beginning of the war, totally inept as a commander. Um, we have learned to make jokes about the French army. What do you call 100,000 Frenchmen with their arms up? The French army. There's a very good reason the war, the French are war adverse. In the first four months of the First World War, the French military will, dis will suffer more casualties than the United States military will in the entire 20th century, in four months. The man is relieved of command two years later, but still had French streets, a town in Pennsylvania, a mountain in Canada, and a real cake named after him. This is a German sniper chocolate cake. Uh, the word sniper um, derived its modern meaning from the First World War. Um, so did the term the lost generation. Uh, this is the Battle of Verdun, as told by French food, Cassolet. Um, and you're probably going, what's the deal with all the food? Uh, at the time, stereotypes of countries were based upon their food. The Germans were depicted as sausages and whatnot. This was one of the two biggest battles of the war. This was between the French and the Germans. And a, uh, it lasted between February and December of 1916. Um, the French suffered 3,000 371,000 casualties, the Germans 337,000. On February 24th alone, 9,000 horses died because they don't fare well against machine guns like human beings. Uh, Henri Designot, a French soldier, said, we are no longer living in a civilized world. He survived Verdun. He was one of the lucky ones. The other major battle of the war was the Battle of the Somme. Um, it was fought from July 1st to November 21st, 1916. Um, the, the British shell the German lines for two weeks. And they think they have cleared out all the trenches, but the Germans moved forward. And the British didn't know it. And the British commander tells the boys, there ain't a German left alive. This is going to be a cakewalk. Well, it wasn't. On the first day of the battle, I kid you not, the British will suffer f almost 58,000 casualties, including almost 20,000 dead. Most of these casualties were within the first hour of the battle. It is the bloodiest day in British history. And that's saying something if you know British history. 
Um, the, the most shocking thing for all this slaughter, the, German, the, the British moved the German line back all of seven miles at a cost of almost 19,000 dead British soldiers per mile. One of my best friends, uh, Kim Papworth, his grandfather fought in the war. Kim is lucky to be a lot, is lucky to have been born. A little more funny stuff. <laughs> I did it a little bit with Kim Jong Il as a big sucker. Um, an interesting fact, according to North Korea, the first time that Kim Jong Il played golf, he shot 38 under par and had five holes in one. <laughs> And he invented the hamburger, according to North Korean state media. Well, you know, and, and he has a recent piece I did. You know, he has a son. So I had to do Kim Jong-un is a big fat sucker because he's quite a bit heavier than his father. I don't know if you heard the story about uh, last summer, a uh, barber in London put up a poster of Kim Jong-un with a, you know, and with a headline that said, having a bad hair day. <laughs> and he was visited by two members of the North Korean embassy who told him to take the poster down. <laughs> he told him to get bent. <laughs> and then it doesn't look very good. There's a uh, uh, Seth Rogen movie coming out where him and James Franco are sent to North, South, North Korea to assassinate Kim Jong-un which caused a, a, an official complaint by North Korea that this could lead to untold retaliation. So my mom's really worried about what might happen to me over <laughs> making him into a giant lollipop <laughs> in 10 delicious flavors. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a, a truncated version of the kind of work I was doing up until um, I took cancer straight on, because I think I was dealing with my illness here tangentially. This is how I dealt, dealt with it. Um, and then, like I said, I, I got cancer again. Um, and I dealt with it slightly different. Um, after a few weeks in the hospital, um, I wasn't doing very well, and I thought I'd deal with it head on by having one of my best friends and a brilliant photographer, Ray Gordon, come and take my picture. Um, forgive me, I'm not a very attractive naked man. Um, but this was a series of three photos. I could stand for about five minutes while they were being taken. Um, scars and all. But what it did for me is I completely lost my fear of cancer after that. I mean, it's just another bully. And so, and unlike my other shows, which were very, I think, personal, this is, this is me dealing with it in my own absurd, warped, demented way. I looked at this show, it, the show kind of started that way, but then I looked at this show as more, more of a celebration. Um, so, this is the piece that Bonnie was talking about that's upstairs. It's called a big bowl of chemotherapies and one Zofran. Most of the chemotherapies that are represented in here are chemotherapies that saved friends of mine's lives. Um, Zofran is probably, no offense to Gleevec, is probably the greatest breakthrough in modern chemotherapy. It's an anti-nausea medicine, so you don't throw up as much. Um, this is a, a kind of a detail of it. And then I took pictures, and I'll just tell, um, actually, I'm going to have Brian read uh, uh, my artist statement from that, and I'll tell, us, tell some stories about a few of these oddly named <laughs> medicines. <laughs> Do you have your artist statement, Jim? <laughs> oh, I don't, it's right on top for you. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Because I can't pronounce all the words <laughs> in my artist statement. 
Welcome to Art for Oncologists. It took 13 years to live through and two years to make. During that time, I have learned my fair share about all things oncology. Imhotep described what is believed to be the first case of cancer, breast cancer in a man in 2500 BC. As far as a recommended treatment, he offered only the chilling words, there is none. Atosa, the queen of Persia, had the first radical mastectomy in 440 BC. 2,500 years later, the surgery is still being performed. I now know why I should know the names Yellow Pergata Sabaro, Sidney Farber, Mary Lasker, and Barnett Rosenberg. The first patent in animal was a mouse bred specifically to be susceptible to cancer. His name is Onco Mouse, and yes, he has a trademark R after his name. I think I know what the HER2 new oncogene, human epidermal growth factor number two, means. Vinblastine was discovered by drinking tea. 5-FU helped save Shane's life. Cytoxin helped save Glenn's life. Herceptin helped save Hilder's life. And Gleevec flat out saved Aldo's life. MOP is a chemotherapy regimen consisting of mechloroethamine, oncovin, procarbazine, and prednisone. It is also an acronym used by the military meaning mission-oriented protective posture, which is a type of safety gear used by military personnel during a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear attack. There is a movie about Herceptin starring Harry Connick Jr. as Dr. Dennis Slayman, the father of Herceptin. I learned crooners turn actors don't make the best oncologist. I also came to the conclusion that Gemzar sounds like a sibling of the great gazoo from the Flintstones. I haven't come across or used so many big ass words since I wrote philosophy papers about Hegel back in the early 80s. Can you say diaminodichloroplatinum? Can you use diaminodichloroplatinum in a sentence? <laughs> Seriously, as a survivor of two cancers, working on the show was an emotional experience. Duh. Especially when it is stuff about chemotherapy that saved lives of my friends. Double duh. Call it enlightened self-interest, but I am fond of having my friends around. Triple duh. I guess you could call the show a celebration. Long live oncologist, longer live their mice, longest live their patience. And yes, even long live their language filled with senseless and really long words. Actually, despite all its diaminodichloroplatinums and bliss chloroethylnitrosiureas and B-cops, clavips, dices, maids, pepsis, pomps, tips, vamps, and VIPs, the core of this language can be translated into a single word, hope. Hope you like art for oncologists. Even more, I hope it gives you a big dose of hope if you are someone you love is dealing with the disease that oncologists were put on this planet to deal with. Love, Riswald. How do I say that word? <laughs> anti-metabolite. Five FU is an anti-metabolite, according to the man. It helped save my friend Shane Edwards' life. Thank you, 5FU. And it's also no secret what FU also means. <laughs> and if you knew my friend Shane Edwards, you would know that he knows how to use FU more than I do, and I really use FU a lot. <laughs> Who says that oncologists don't have a sense of humor? Be seeing you. An oncologist will tell you be seeing you means a mustard gas related <laughs> beta chloronitrosiurea <laughs> compound used as an alkylating agent in chemotherapy to treat several types of brain cancer, including glioblastoma, glioblastoma multiforme, medulloblastoma, and astrocytoma, multiple myeloma, and lymphoma. <laughs> and it's sometimes used in conjunction with alkyl guanine transferase inhibitors such as O6 benzyl guanine that increase the efficacy of BCNU by inhibiting the direct reversal pathway of DNA repair, which will prevent formation of the inner strand crosslink between the N1 of guanine and the N3 of cytosine. Urban Dictionary will tell you BCNU means be seeing you. 
as in, OMG, my oncologist is calling you. Be seeing you. <laughs> Cis platinum. Uh, Barrett Rosen Rosenberg discovered this um, by experimenting on bacteria. And he found when it was uh, exposed to an electric field, ex specifically two platinum electrodes, the cells would stop dividing. It became, uh, and it was first used to treat uh, testicular cancer and increase the cure rate from 10% to 85%. Now it comes with an unfortunate, it is the most debilitating chemotherapy there is. My wife, my former wife is an oncology nurse and she said that it had, she, that it was nicknamed the dubious nickname, cisflatin. Um, before Zofran, patients threw up on an average of 12 times a day when they had cisplatinum. Again, cytaxin. Uh, I always thought cytaxin sounded more like an evil Jewish nemesis of Batman than any kind of drug I would ever want in my system. Holy hematology, Batman, it's cytaxin. It is all, cytaxin is one of the ingredients along with some uh, hydro... Hydroxydonorubicin oncumin and prednisone. <laughs> in, the, in the chemotherapy regimen CHOP, and is primarily used to treat lymph noma. Cytoxin helped save my Jewish friend's Glenn Rockowitz life twice. Holy... Cis blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Batman, cytoxin saved Rockowitz's life. I'm not Jewish, so forgive me. Ashem Dank, cytoxin. There's the, the relative of the great kazoo. And if anybody's a football fan, don't you think that, uh, what's his name, the quarterback for uh, San Francisco? What's his name? Kaepernick? Kaepernick? Cavern. He looks like the Great Kazoo. <laughs> My favorite drug of all times, and I used to take a lot of drugs. <laughs> um, here's a little story. On August 16, 2000, I was diagnosed with CML. I was told I had somewhere between two to four years to live. Later that year, this man calls me while he's boarding a plane to Houston and tells me, I hear we have to meet. We meet. He, because uh, Gleevec was not FDA approved at the time, he introduced me to daily doses of interferon. Interferon is no fun. In May of 2001, I meet Gleevec, his newfangled treatment for CML. Sometime in early 2004, my mom and I watch a movie called Ripley's Game. It is about a family man who wants to provide for his family and becomes a hitman because he has nothing to lose. He has nothing to lose because he is dying of CML. This upsets even my chronically optimistic mother. I try to convince her that despite my illness, I will not become a hitman. I do not convince her. Later in 2004, tests can't find any leukemia in 100,000 of my cells. They still can't. Thank you, Brian. My mom thanks you a thousand and one times for, for preventing me from becoming a hitman. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to read this or you want to you're, read You're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned before, Herceptin, or as Brian mentioned, Herceptin is a movie star. Herceptin st starred in Living Proof, a horrible movie. <laughs> with Harry Connick Jr., a movie based on Dr. Dennis Lehman's treat development of the drug. Living Proof is not to be confused with Living Proof, the Hank Williams Jr. story. Before Herceptin was a movie star, it was a literary star featured in the book H.E.R. -E 2, The Making of Herceptin, a revolutionary treatment for breast cancer. Herceptin was indeed a revolution, one that took 12 years. Slayman and his colleagues at UCLA identified 
the HR2 Nuo Oncogene Human Epidural Growth Factor number, Receptor number 2. Thankfully, he called it HER2 for short. He found that 25% of breast cancer patients were HER2 positive, which meant that they had a protein that caused cancer cells to reproduce uncontrollably, and subsequently their tumors grew much faster than normal. There was no happy ending for this, these patients. Slayman targeted that gene. He discovered a BFD. When he added an antibody to the specific protein, he slowed cell growth and the resulting tumor shrank dramatically. His original studies showed that Herceptin, then known as the tongue twister, <laughs> trastuzumab. Tra say that loud? Trastuzumab. <laughs> improved overall survival in late stage breast cancer patients from 20.3 months to 25.1 months. At the time, that's a big deal. In September 1988, the FDA approved Herceptin to treat, treat HER2 positive women with metastatic breast cancer. It was the first targeted chemotherapeutic agent to receive FDA approval. Herceptin's real star is Barbara Bradfield. The art teacher was dying from terminal metastatic breast cancer. In, in 1992, she partici participated in Slayman's first phase one trials of Herceptin. In 1993, a year later, she showed no trace of the disease. Today, she lives happily ever after in Puyallup, Washington. It also saved my friend Hilder's name, who, and I can't pronounce her last name, because it's harder to pronounce than that <laughs> word he just said. And uh, last but not least is methotrexate. A um, couple interesting things. This is used to treat many uh, diseases, not only cancers, and many cancers. Um, Ironic, it was invented in 1950. It's still being used today. That could tell you something. Um, but it is a bit of a BFD, and Yellow Paraga Sabarano is a bigger BFD for inventing it. In 1950, 1950 Doran K. Entram, another doctor, wrote, you probably never heard of Dr. Sabaro. Yet because he lived, you may be alive and are well today. Because he lived, you may live longer. In 1981, Sabral got a fungus named in, in his honor that I can't pronounce. So that's kind of, those were like eight of the 10 chemotherapies that were, that are in the, what some people call the giant heart-shaped hot tub upstairs. Um, uh, and then sometimes you get some things in the mail that makes it all worthwhile. And because I, I think I overestimated the cancer art market and the, as I did the Hitler art market and the Mao art market and the Napoleon art market and the Kim Jong-un art market. But I received this letter from a nurse. Um, and she said, I was in Portland two weeks back and became engulfed with your big bull piece at the Portland Art Museum. I'm a breast care coordinator at Eisenhower Medical Center and I have been a nurse for 30 years. I have never been as taken by a work of art that is, that is related to cancer. You succeeded in creating a work of hope. Chemo is approachable and respected through your work. It has broken through the fear and dread. I'll take that over a sale any day. Now a little fun. <laughs> uh, I'll zoom in so you can read it. You won't be able to read it, but as you can see, these people have a language all their own. It's a language of unpronounceable words, often several different unpronounceable words for the exact same chemotherapy. Um, and there's a wonderful play by uh, Margaret Edson, her play called Wit. And in that play, Dr. Vivian Baring, an English professor, is dying of stage four ovarian cancer. Her oncologist 
spouts a nonsensical array of verbiage. These are all made up chemotherapies. Hexomethoplasmacell with vinplatin to potentiate. Hex at 300 milligrams per meter squared. Vin at 100 a day of cycle two, day three. Both cycles at full dose. Professor Baring is terrified, infuriated by her disease, but not as terrified and infuriated by her oncologist's butchering of the English language. <laughs> so, some say tomato. Some say tomato. <laughs> some say the theotopia. Some say triethylene thiophosphoramine. <laughs> So this was a series of eight prints that just got more ridiculous. Some say tomato. Some say tomato. Some say BCNU. Some say bischlorethylnitrosiurea. <laughs> and they just got more and more ridiculous. So we're not, you know, you can see this language just keeps going. These were silk screens, and I actually put faux diamond dust in them so they sparkled. All these fancy words. Um, the interesting story about Gleevec, that it was originally spelled G-L-I-V-E-C, which is how it's spelled in the rest of the world. But why isn't it spelled that way here? Because it would be mispronounced Gleevec and confused with Gliberide, a treatment for diabetes. Of course it would. <laughs> do I have cancer or diabetes? I don't know. Which medicine do I take? <laughs> So they just get more and more and more ridiculous. This is a game changer of a paper. It's called the Farber paper. And um, it was the first successful use of chemotherapy in uh, cancer. I think it was 1948. Um, I'll have Brian tell you a little, little bit about Dr. Farber, who had quite a reputation, and then I'll end on a little, little anecdote about him. Yeah, so I worked at what was called the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, named for Sidney Farber at Harvard Medical School. And Sidney was considered the father of modern chemotherapy. And he wasn't a particularly nice person, but, and I never knew him, um, but his reputation was not to be, and I think Jim will tell you a story. But Sidney Farber reasoned that there were biochemical pathways that regulated cell growth. And he thought that folate, which is a vitamin that many of us take, would actually counteract the growth of leukemia. So they actually treated some children with folate and their leukemias grew faster. And he realized I may be onto something here because if I antagonize folate, if I inhibit it with an antifolate, I may actually have something that will work. And that's exactly what he did. He began to treat the very first child at Boston Children's Hospital with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which in those days was a death sentence. Six kids lived six weeks. They were, had horrible bone pain. He gave them a dose of this, what was called aminoptrin, and the kid went into remission very, very quickly. Now, he relapsed 12 weeks later, but that doubled the survival. It was absolutely unheard of for anybody to have seen that. And that was the impetus for this paper here that Jim has here from 1948. So it's, it's, it's called a Portrait of Sidney Farber in six and one-fifth pages. Um, I grew up a Lutheran. You are defined by your work, for better or worse. My father still thinks that. I, th I think there's a little more to humanity than that. But this paper reads like a mystery novel. You can see, that you can just, it's just like, wow. And, and, you know, at the time though, Farber was, you know, a lot of people thought it was inhumane and barbaric. You're, you're experimenting on children. Well, these children were basically dead. And it did lead to major breakthroughs. Um, Farber himself wrote, quote, no evidence has been mentioned 
in this report that would justify the suggestion of the term cure in acute leukemia in children, a promising direction for further research concerning the nature and treatment of le acute leukemia in children appears to have been established by the observations reported. Talk about tempered enthusiasm, <laughs> but that's that. <laughs> um, and it was a promising direction that indeed gave Farber the hope in the words of one of his assistants, quote, that one could dream of a cure, unquote. Farber dreamed of killing malignant cancer cells and curing leukemia and more common forms of cancers with chemicals, or as one researcher called them, penicillin for cancer. His dream would change cancer treatment forever. Farber died on March 30th, 1973. He was found on his desk face down on a neat pile of research paper, it's no doubt full of more dreams. This was his sidekick, Mary Lasker, of which he, this man over here to my left won an award in her name. Um, do you know who she is? Um, she is, this is based on a real stamp, she is considered the fairy godmother of medical research. Um, she was also married to an advertising big shot named Al Albert Lasker. She bemused, quote, if a toothpaste deserved advertising at the rate of two or three or four million dollars a year, then research against diseases maiming and crippling the people of the United States and in the rest of the world deserved hundreds of millions of dollars. Duh. She started the war on cancer with Sidney Farber. She dared none other than Richard fucking Nixon to cure cancer in an ad. It read, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. Um, and it ran on December 9th, 1969. And the copy in truncated uh, read, if prayers are heard in heaven, this prayer must be heard the most. Dear God, please, not cancer. We urge you, to re we urge you Mr. President, to remember that we spend more each day on military matters than each year on cancer research and last year more than 21 times as much on space research as cancer research. If you fail us, Mr. President, this will happen. One in six million, one in six Americans alive now, 34 million people will die of cancer unless new cures are found. One in four Americans now alive, 51 million people will have cancer in the future. We simply cannot afford this. Well, Nixon listen. Thanks no in, part to, in no small part to Teddy Kennedy. And on December 23rd, 1971, Nixon signed the National Cancer Act. And the war continues today. Now many of these pieces I dedicated to friends of mine. Well, I dedicated this piece to this friend of mine because he is the fairy godfather of medical research. I call him Cancer's Cancer. He has won the Lasker Award and all this makes it fairly obvious to whom a portrait of Mary Lasker as a fairy godmother wearing a fuck cancer button should be dedicated, don't you think? <laughs> this man. This is the mouse we talked about, uh, Anka Mouse, first, the first mouse, uh, first animal ever to receive a trademark, and it, and it led to actually a nasty court battle between its two fathers. Um, and uh, it's dread, bred specifically to be receptive to cancer to try new treatments on. But I found an interesting quote from Dr. William Seaman Bainbridge, whom the island to the north of us is named after. Seventy years before the birth of this mouse, he wrote, throughout the centuries, the sufferer from this disease, cancer, has been the subject of almost every conceivable form of experimentation. Hardly any animal has escaped making its contribution in hair or hide, tooth or toenail, thymus or thyroid, liver or spleen, spleen in the vain search by man for a means of relief. Well, certainly a genetically modified mouse bred to get cancer is no exception. So I think we should thank this mouse. 
one of my heroes, Don Quixote. <laughs> this is Don Quixote fights cancer. Don Quixote hoped and dreamed big. He is my hero. It is possible to score 356 points in Scrabble with Quixotic. I hope and dream of scoring 356 points in Scrabble with Quixotic. And the dedication? Don Quixote has de dedicated every patient of every oncologist ever. After all, as oncologist Siddhartha Mukherjee wrote in The Emperor of All Maladies, the story of cancer isn't the story of doctors who struggle and survive, moving from one institution to another. It is a story of patients who struggle and survive, moving from one embankment of illness to another. Resilience, inventiveness, and survivorship, qualities often ascribed to great physicians are reflected qualities, emanating first from those who struggle with illness and only then mirrored by those who treat them. If the history of medicine is told through the story of doctors, it is because their contributions stand in place of their more substantive heroism of their patients. May they all score 356 points in Scrabble with Quixotic. And then wrapping up, I did a really big portrait of Brian, <laughs> uh, 30 inches by 160 inches big. It's called Portrait of Brian Drucker in 365 Days. A Gleevec a day keeps the CML away. Um, because I don't know how familiar you are with this disease, but it is basically a pill a day with very few, if any, side effects. Certainly none of the side effects of interferon and certainly a lot more success than interferon. So I thought it was a fitting portrait because I think it's a fair trait. Uh, a pill a day to keep it away. I mean, the survival rate from two to five years now, what, up to 30? We the bus not. thing. <laughs> it's the bus thing. You're going to get hit by a bus, or in this town, a cyclist. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, and he'll yell at you for running you over. <laughs> um, and uh, just to show what goes around comes around, I couldn't resist. Um, I had to mix my fascination with dictators. This, I don't know if you read Italian, but this says, Mussolini says, fuck cancer. And I actually made this for a friend of mine. Um, have you ever been to Piazza Italia on jo Northwest Johnson? Well, Gino uh, Sedanini was the, uh, the founder of the restaurant. Um, he was a friend of mine, we joined the cancer club about the same time. And he went through traditional chemotherapy, and I thought his baldness courtesy of chemotherapy made him look exactly like Mussolini. <laughs> and of course, Gino played up his likeness, chemotherapy handed it to him. He did a great hands-on, hip, chin held high, self, you know, important impersonation of the buffoon Mussolini. Gino defiantly stood up to cancer, much like Mussolini defiantly stood up to, among other things, goodness, politeness, joy, humility, democracy, and all-around pleasantness. Gino was no Mussolini despite the chemo-induced likeness. Gino was the anti-Mussolini, since he was a man overflowing with goodness, politeness, joy, humility, and all-around pleasantness. However, some of his employees will dispute whether Gino was democratic. He will always be missed. Mussolini, despite what he wanted on his tombstone, will never be missed. Therefore, I think Gino wins. Thank you. Well, normally, when I've given talks with Jim, particularly after the Hitler show, I'd have to apologize for him. I think tonight I don't have to. <laughs> but for me, what inspired me was, um, was actually Sidney Farber. And I remember I had a class my first year of medical school. I read that paper. And I thought, that's amazing. You can go from a death sentence to a cure with a combination of chemotherapy drugs. And that was amazing. But it just seemed barbaric and these chemotherapy drugs that you can't pronounce and 
years of speech therapy so I could sit up here and be his foil. Um, and it just didn't seem right. But if you understand what Sidney Farber was saying was he was trying to say, we need to understand what drives the growth of cancer. And if we can do that, we can, we can target cancer specifically. Now, the problem was 20 odd years ago, not many people believed that was possible. And so when I went and I asked for a job at Dana-Farber, the head of Dana-Farber said, I don't think you have a future here. So I found my way to Oregon where they're a little bit more accepting of unusual ideas. And within six weeks of starting here, I had a compound in my lab that killed leukemia cells without harming normal cells. Now, you'd think, okay, well, that's great. You're going to go right into the clinic. But I now had to deal with one of the biggest drug companies in the world that had never developed a cancer drug. And they did the market projections and thought, this will never make any money for us. And it's going to kill people. And it's like any chemotherapy drug. So they didn't want to develop it. But What's been remarkable to me and, and what Jim has always taught me is how much faith your patients put in you. And I wasn't just a researcher isolated in a lab. I was a doctor. I was seeing patients. They had this leukemia and they needed me to be their champion. And so we ultimately convinced the drug company to go to clinical trials. We started in 1998. Within six months, every single one of our patients had their blood counts returned to normal. And within three years, we were on the cover of Time magazine with the fastest FDA approval in the history of the FDA, and that record still stands. And what we did was we understood what drove the growth of a cancer, and we targeted it, and we took a disease, as you heard from Jim, that had a three to five year life expectancy, and now we've turned it into something that we expect people to live a normal lifespan. So that was remarkable, and that was a revolution in the way we think about cancer. And because of the work we did here, there are now literally dozens of these drugs that are FDA approved, hundreds more in the clinical trials and thousands more in the development pipeline and hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved. And that's been remarkable. So just over a year ago, um, I was set to lay out our vision for what do we do next? And as part of this, I was introduced by Phil Knight. And much like with this talk with Jim, nobody remembers a word I say because of what you've heard from Jim. And what Phil Knight surprised everybody in the audience, including me, was that he would donate $500 million for cancer research to OHSU if we matched it with a similar amount within two years. And it was an all or nothing. So. That was remarkable. <laughs> but despite the fact that nobody remembers what I said that night, people remember what Phil Knight said that night. What Phil Knight said is it's incumbent upon each of us in the room to keep the miracles coming. And he said, is there a higher calling than curing cancer? And those words still resonate with us tonight. But today, just over a year, we stand at $440 million raised. That includes $200 million in bonding authority from the state legislature that was granted in March of this year. Um, we've had donors from all 50 states, but 75% has come from with Oregon. Oregon has made this their cause. Uh, it's just been remarkable to think about what's happened here, how people have just come out and donated. But what we laid out in this vision was that just as we did 20 years ago, it's time for us to change the way we think about cancer. And it's just as we did 20 years ago, we said we've got to understand what drives the growth of cancer to treat it. We need to think about doing the same thing with early detection. If you think about how we treat cancer, it's almost like we say, let's wait till it gets really bad and then we'll treat you. Why aren't we taking the same knowledge of what drives the growth of cancer and using it to detect it early. So we recognize at the night that this is where the future lies. But we also have to do things differently. Most scientists work in isolation. They rarely come out of their labs. Sometimes they'll collaborate if there's necessity. 
What we want to do is we want to bring 20 to 30 people here and their teams as 200 to 300 researchers and have them work as a team to solve the problem. And we don't do that enough in science. We don't set goals like this. But we want to do that and we will do that. So this team will look at imaging technologies that can identify changes in tissues that will tell us we have cancer. Or simple blood tests that will tell us that we have cancer. And that's what we're going to do at the Knight Cancer Institute. So I've actually, I've been incredibly inspired by the people who've donated. This has included some school children um, at a lemonade stand. Um, this has included businesses and labor getting together with a campaign that's called Unite for the Night, Business and Labor. When we got the approval for the bonding, it was approved by Republicans and Democrats 85 to 5. Cancer isn't partisan. Everyone could rally behind that. We've also understood that we want Oregon to be the place where we end the battle against cancer. And <laughs> how can we lose when we have one tough mother <laughs> in the fight <laughs> against cancer? She looks like a chicken you know, <laughs> I would, I would not, not go there. And I, Gert and I just had a blast that day. And she was extremely happy and we just had fun. But she inspired our patients. And it's really about our patients. So here we have Mary Kay who's battling lymphoma. And she has the tattoo, One Tough Patient. And that's really our goal. And that's why Jim is here and that's why Jim has done what he's done. It's about hope, it's about courage, and it's about every single cancer patient winning their battle. And that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Thank you very much. Give me one minute. <laughs> Jim's going to just step out for a second. He'll be right back. But if you um, have some questions, think about them, and we'll do. Let's look at what time it is. Seven eighteen. So we're okay. <laughs> we'll do a tiny bit. Uh, you know, a few questions, and then by maybe about seven thirty, it'll give you a chance to go over and look at the galleries. We have a little presentation here. I, s I scuffed it up, but water takes it off. <laughs> This is for you from us. Thank you, Jim. Sixty million more dollars and more, even more millions than that will lead to more of these and they'll have to put up with more schmucks like me. <laughs> so take the good with the bad. Great. Do we have any questions? Anybody want to ask a question? Uh, yes. More just commentary. Um, was, uh, my grandma passed away a while ago from <coughs> cancer, and I just remember like, the process. Um, we went from like, cybernetic therapy or treatments, which are extremely expensive, all the way to Cuba for scorpion venom treatments. It was just a really absurd uh, period of time for the family. But uh, she always uh, made comments. She did something. Another question? Yes. Uh, I have one up front first, and then we'll come back there. Question, Jim. I'm curious if the evolution of your thought the theme of dictators for your work. I like making fun of bad things. <laughs> 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 um, well, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I'm, for better or worse, I've always been fascinated by evil. humanities teacher, Mrs. Harmon, at Ingram High School. And she taught me big words like hubris 
And I read books like, or plays like UNESCO's Rhinoceros and Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. So I learned about satire and wit. And then I stumbled across the absurdist wit of Monty Python. And you, you, everything is funny. I mean, it is the best medicine. It's, it sounds like a hoary cliche, but it worked for me. And it's just, I mean, it worked for Mel Brooks. He dealt with the evil of Hitler by, you know, with springtime for Hitler. I mean, and Modest Proposal is, you know, Ireland's starving. So to get somebody to recognize this and deal with it, Jonathan Swift says, well, let's just eat children and we'll all live. And his people are outraged, but it drew attention to the problem. And as, as a, you know, a, a, ironically, my next show is, um, is gonna go back to the, the Nazis because it, it, they keep making better toys and better dolls. <laughs> it's just, I, I can't turn this opportunity down. I found these dolls in China that, that are so lifelike that the pictures look real. And I had some more fun at that buffoon and his fellow buffoon, buffoon's expense. Um, it was scheduled for a show, two different shows in, in Amsterdam. But I told them exactly what I was going to do. And once they saw the work, they canceled the show. <laughs> Somebody in New York saw it and wants to make a book out of it. So we're... Um, do you have a question in the back? Yeah. So there, there are two things that are coming along. And first of all is the current genetic tests are limited to maybe a couple hundred genes. Well, we have 30,000 genes in our genome. So the reality is, is you probably do have some or may have some predisposition, but it hasn't been identified. Or in fact, you may actually not have a genetic predisposition because of an inheritance pattern in your family. So my point here is that as we expand our knowledge of genetics and risks, and that to me is participatory research. We need people that are willing to donate blood samples, get their genetics tested, and then be followed up for 20 to 30 years. And that's a huge societal participatory research project so we can identify what those risks are and who has them and who doesn't. And then people say, well, my insurance company will get a hold of that information. Well, but you're trying to make a decision about your life. And I'm worried about whether your insurance company is going to charge you a higher premium. That doesn't make sense to me. I think we need to get very clear about what our goals are, and that's to improve human health and to help you make these difficult choices. The other thing that's coming along are much better early detection technologies for ovarian cancer in particular, and for this gentleman for pancreatic cancer as well. Two of the most deadly cancers, and because we detect them very late. Clearly, those are two cancers, so we've got to move that up so we can find them earlier when they're most curable, and then that makes that decision, I can wait, I'll be caught early, and I'll be fine. Those are the things that are coming. I wish I had them today, um, but we're going to work on it. 
Is there much research going on now about environmental triggers and things that are happening? I know at one point I saw a map of cancer in Montana and there were some places where there was a lot of cancer because there'd been dumps from, uh, airborne dumps from nuclear yeah. blasts in Nevada. And are there things like that that are going forward too? There are definitely things that are looking at clusters and trying to identify environmental factors. Um, we certainly know that in the Northwest, breast cancer and melanoma are really high rates. We don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's an opportunity there to understand that because you understood that we might understand more about uh, how we could prevent these diseases. Okay, interesting. Do you have any, yes? Yeah, so Ken Burns is working on a, a documentary on the Emperor of All Maladies. It'll air in March of 2015. Um, they spent a couple of hours filming at OHSU, and Elisa Williams, who's on our communications team, has been back and forth sharing more videos and B-roll and photos, and so um, yours truly will be in a, at least a small part of it toward the end. Can you mention of the night challenge? I doubt it. No, it, it's, and the night challenge is certainly unprecedented, uh, both in terms of its size and timing, but um, the focus really is on the history, and Gleevec is kind of the culmination of that history. It's a fascinating book. Great. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you so much, Dr. Drucker and Jim, for sharing your art, your science, and everything with us. And if anybody wants to just wander out the door and up into the museum to see the uh, big bowl of chemotherapies in one Zofran, we'll be up there in a little bit. So um, elevator to the fourth floor right past the gift shop. Thank you.